You cannot keep making laws and rules just because you think cannabis is the cash cow. It's kind of like a reverse war on drugs or a war on drugs 2.0. It's like you're setting us up to fail. Many individuals and operators just don't start a chance before they even get out of the gate. And those issues are, are even compounded for the average social equity applicant who in many cases doesn't have any resources, doesn't have any access to resources, and the resources that exist are looking past him. I do see the more that we get out and talk about it, people just don't even understand what social equity is. You know, there's a lot of damage that has been caused by the war on drugs, and it's just not about the arrests. It's about the children that were left without fathers and mothers. How were their lives changed? The educational systems in those communities. All of those things should be being addressed in these states that legalize cannabis. You have particularly communities of color who were most targeted by the war on drugs, who were in the cannabis world going to state prison for long sentences and putting themselves at risk having communities torn apart it sent a lot of people to prison uh, it caused a lot of people to receive felonies for non-violent drug offense low-level uh, drug offense uh, small possessions when we look at just the actual historical data we can see that disproportionately black and brown peoples primarily black and brown uh, men were disproportionately incarcerated for, you know, technically a victimless crime. Because once you legalize cannabis, then it's no longer a crime. Why wouldn't those same very people that started and uh, created an industry for big business to come in and take over not be able to have access as owners and operators? Not just workers, but owners and operators. We talk about the war on drugs and the policies and delays and, oh, sorry, we're just building the department. We are understaffed. You go to the Budget and Finance Committee. Oh, we don't have enough money. You get awarded the money and there still are no programs. And then no one ever addresses the humans and the people who have changed their lives dramatically, believing that if, if it is spoken in the law, that it was being held to be true and it has not. They failed us on that one. Minorities are underrepresented in the cannabis industry, but as far as those people of color that are trying to get into the industry, uh, the ne negative impact for them is that they're holding their locations, still paying leases on their locations after two years, and they haven't gotten a license. Some of their investors are walking away. Some of them aren't even gonna be able to make it uh, once that license is issued. Uh, so uh, it's, it's had a very devastating impact on those who want to come into the business. This building that we're in is actually a retail location that I've been holding on almost two years now. I'm right on Crenshaw Boulevard um, where I raised my girls and where I've walked down the street to visit my grandfather at, at the mall while he was working. There hasn't been a demographic more harm by the war on drugs than the African-American community and the poor community. How do we mitigate that and give back to those communities in a way that builds up not only those communities, but all the other communities that have suffered? Create that ability for all those hardworking, honest Americans of all different stripes that everyone has a fair chance. And where those groups who have systemic oppression on them, how do we put in place systemic support to counter that? These equity programs don't exist in a vacuum. So they're building on 20 years of history of, of cannabis legalization in, in California, medical cannabis legalization, and decades and centuries of disparities in terms of access to wealth and property ownership. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of catch up to be done. This program was, was imperative to level the playing field, to say that everyone deserves equal treatment and if it's okay for one group of people, it's okay for another. And so we, we have seen the cannabis convictions in the city of Oakland drastically reduced uh, with this, you know, the inception of the social equity program. Cities have a lot of opportunities to play a role in terms of how cannabis is made available 
um, and who, who gets an opportunity to create or sell cannabis products because in California, for example, there's local control that allows local jurisdictions to sort of determine you know, the number of dispensaries and where they are located and such. We need to do the right thing. And the right thing by the African American community, the right thing by every community that's been tarnished by the war on drugs and affected by the war on drugs. Because now you have a bunch of people who historically don't come from business backgrounds, don't come from legal backgrounds, sitting down with sharks on the other side. There's a fair amount of frustration um, with either a slow regulatory process or a mercurial regulatory process that's changing all the time uh, that has people a bit at wit's end um, to figure out how to stay with it, um, to stay afloat while they come into compliance. The obstacles that me and many other operators have had to overcome uh, to get to where we are now are an untold amount and ever, ever growing. Um, licensing is very complex um, and operating is even more complex. It's ultimately a learning curve for the average operator to understand exactly what the state and the cities are looking for in regards to how you operate your business and, and ultimately what you have to pay to operate your business. It's completely turned into a pay to play scenario. Licensing, especially for retail, is extremely scarce. Licensing in general is complicated from the point of having an opportunity to apply to actually getting operational is a lot longer than people think. I think people thought that local governments would very quickly uh, fall, fall in line and regulate this and allow this and make so many more local licenses possible. Operators are struggling to deal with operating in the regulated market, dealing with cost of compliance, just transitioning from totally unregulated to uh, being regulated at both at the local and state level. And it's particularly challenging for small businesses, equity businesses um, in particular. Almost every element of this industry has changed, which is one of the primary reasons that we're seeing such a high failure rate. Well, people have their licenses one day, they lose them the next day. How am I supposed to keep up with that? I mean, just to keep track of the legislation, you pretty much got to do research about seven hours a week. As an, as an owner, you have to, just to be on your, your toes, on your P's and your Q's. But you're already working 15 to 18 hour days. And a lot of us have families. A lot of us have other hobbies that we like to do. But it's like, you know, you're working big time hours and you're, it, it's tough. Passing Prop 64, in my opinion, I think a lot of policymakers, local and state, have kind of had one foot in and one foot out. They haven't gone all in and uh, supporting the will of the people and you know, actually making this uh, the best market possible. It's not really what I think most people were expecting when they voted for Proposition 64. I don't think people expected a free-for-all with no regulation, and I don't think anybody pushed for that who uh, advocated for Prop 64 but we're still lagging behind on local access. You have licensing fees primarily um, on a city and state level, and then you have uh, some cities that actually have a deeper level of licensing. In some cases, you have to license the building and the business, as well as obtain a state license. And so licensing alone can cost you in the tens of thousands. Because cannabis is illegal at, uh, on the federal level, you can't go to a bank and ask for a loan to start a cannabis business. When I get asked out on the street, how much does it cost to get involved? And let's keep in mind here that delivery is the most easily accessible license out of all of them. And for that one, I tell people, if you don't have at this point 70,000 liquid, you, you don't want to try to get involved. And that's, a, that's being generous about it. There's a lot of hoops and hurdles to not only get your local license or authorization, then getting your state local authorization um, getting building and safety, if you need a conditional use permit, if you need to get the county's public health or fire to sign off on your build out. Um, these things I've seen people go 12, 15, 18 months and counting, even after having a local authorization in hand. It's very difficult for people at all the different stages to, to get the licenses that they need and know that they're operating correctly. The lack of licenses in California as a whole 
and how that impacts California in a negative way is uh, you do have pockets of city that uh, are not participating in legalization. So therefore, there are a lot of people that uh, don't have uh, safe and affordable access to cannabis. The, the percentages really have gone vastly up, but we're still looking at 70% of the state not allowing this. We're also looking within that 30% at a lot of jurisdictions who allow it in incredibly small models. But that's not improving local consumer access. And, and that's a huge problem. We have also allowed cities uh, discretion in terms of setting the zoning to zone the industry out of existence or to have the high taxes or um, hyper-restrictive um, regulations. Uh, and even though it may, it, it seemed in theory good at the time, we're gonna tell cities you can have local control. What it's done is effectively ban cannabis in a large majority of California. So in big swaths of the state, people have little or no access to cannabis. When you have 188 shops in, in the city of Los Angeles that are legal and licensed, and then you have about maybe 1,500 that are unlicensed, you know, it's kind of hard to compete with that. You know, that, that's a common refrain. You guys make so much money anyway. You can afford it. People will pay anything for this. It sells itself. None of this is true. Yes, there is money. Yes, at this point in time, many people who are operating cannabis businesses, they're trying to make money. But if you want businesses to survive and to thrive, to expand, to employ more people, to have free market competition, to have prices lower. You need more local licenses. You need more opportunity. So fundamentally in the state of California, to support a thriving marketplace, we need to open up the support of the increased licensing within the state and then within local jurisdictions so that we can help support the industry and get the products and the inventory to the proper hands and through the proper channel. We've gone in some ways too far and made it so expensive to operate a legal cannabis business um, that, you know, it, it just, again, fuels the illicit market and drives up prices. It costs a lot of money to open a dispensary. Dispensaries, at minimum, in my opinion, cost at least $3 million to open if you have to buy the property. What they frame it as is that we're all millionaires. That's what everyone thinks. Oh, the cannabis market's a billion dollars. There's the big corporate guys who get millions of dollars in investment, who go to these seminars and got the big three-piece suits on and are pulling up in Maseratis. Then there's guys like me that flew over on Spirit Airlines, took an Uber over, try to adapt as much information as I can, try to learn as much as I can, and apply it to the business and try to stay ahead of the curve. It shouldn't be this hard to get clarification. We need to have greater access to be able to ask the state questions. And they do reply, but to be honest with you, it can take weeks. We don't have the flexibility of like a hair salon. A hair salon already has a process in place. So you know where you need to go and submit your application. You know the licenses that your hairstylist need to have. And there's a template uh, and resources that walk you through that process. That doesn't exist in the cannabis industry. This is the law of the land. The people have spoken. So let us not put our heads in the stand. Let us work proactively to encourage local jurisdictions to open up, to make sure that the regulations and protections are in place to do this in a thoughtful fashion. And we need to simplify the structure. We need to make it easier for people running businesses to collect and remit and calculate taxes. There's a lot of work that we still have to do on a state level. Uh, tax-wise, regulation-wise. Uh, there's still this program that we need to finish rolling out with social equity. California needs to put their money where their mouth is and hire the proper staff to execute on these programs, whether it's social equity or whether it's just licensing and application processing. And there is a way to have big business and also make sure that the small people have the additional support that they need. They need to bring on people who actually know the industry. They need to get consultants. You know, they've got all these subcommittees and committees for cannabis, but they don't have anyone who's actually been in the field. I am not a subject matter expert in this field, but it's imperative then that we have those that are in the industry 
to help inform and help shape the future of cannabis in the state of California. We can have good regulation without making it so expensive. We can, we can have good taxes without making them so high that it fuels the illicit market. We can have smart zoning without allowing cities to effectively ban cannabis in big swaths of California. We're just not taking a balanced approach right now. Um, we need to move towards a more balanced approach. I think that many people are fearful of government or don't like politicians. We have a bad rap. Uh, but the reality is that we are beholden to the people. We work for everyday people, but it is incumbent upon everyday Californians to hold us accountable. Know who your public representatives are, go visit them in their offices, have a personal relationship with their staff members, join your chambers of commerce, your local community-based organizations, and be part of the community. And that's where I think we can build off of this. Thank you.